uh, real crooked grain wood. Like, for instance, stuff like that. You see the way the grain matches in that? Now that's punky wood. And you could get burl or crotch or any of those crooked grain woods. So the project is designed in such a way that when you part off the top from the body, whatever width of wood you lose, you replace it with exactly the same width of a contrasting wood. And that means that when you twist it around, your grain matches always, see? Now it can be quite, uh, it, you can do this with burl, you can do it with spalted, all kinds of stuff. So, right, now some of what I'm going to do is going to be so obvious, but I'm still going to do it. So you start with a square block, usually it would have a much crookeder grain than this, but we'll just use this for the moment. Now, how do you find center on one of those? Guess. What? Guess. Yeah, you're right. Well, here's a good way of doing it. You just get your finger like that. One, two, three, four. Make it smaller. Now, I can see why I'm using this as a demo. It's a piece of crap. What? No. I'm talking about the piece of wood. That lathe is a good lathe. Yeah, back home I use a one way two four three six or is that three six two four? A lot of times when you find a piece of wood, um, the best time to judge how the grain will look when it's finished is when you cut it first, because it's still got the moisture in and it's got the colour. And at that point, what I do is, if I'm cutting wood for something else, and I see a nice piece of wood for a box, I put it aside and I put it in plastic so it stays wet. And when I want to do a batch of them, take them out and I round them down just like I'm doing now and when I've got them cylinderized I decide where I want to put my joint line and that is important when you're using spalted wood because you don't want to divide spalted wood right where there's a point or where there's a little star or something so you just kind of mark with the pencil where the body and the lid are going to be joined. And um, sometimes you might make a decision to put it right up here and shorten the body, you know what I mean? So, wood is wood, you can lose a bit. So, now I just put a couple of. Um, couple of tenons on the end give them a slight dovetail shape and uh, this is a special little tool which you've heard me talk about here before those of you that have been here before uh, 
when I was here, and it's a uh, ordinary one-eighth parting tool, high-speed steel. And now, why is one side longer than the other? Pure laziness. See that? One's longer than the other. Just couldn't be bothered keeping them straight. So, now, you know those groove parting tools you buy and the groove is all the way down the blade? You seen those? Yeah, well, don't buy them. Or if you do, sand the groove off. Alright, so what you do, you take one of these. Now you can't do it on a CBN wheel, but you take it to the corner of your grinder and you grind just a little bit of a groove right there like that. You ever try doing this? Anyway, when you look at yourself, it's backwards, so you keep going the wrong way. <laughs> but anyway, you put a groove in it on the edge of a stone like that, having sharpened it first. And I'll pass this around when I'm finished with it so you can see. And again, it's one of those things professionals do. They take good, perfect tools with great ideas and then they mess them up. The idea behind having the groove is that you turn the groove down. Never turn the groove up. You'll only ever do that once. Okay? Groove down. And widen the hole ever so slightly. Widen the cut. Towards the end you just loosen the pressure a little bit there. If you're doing a lot of them, put numbers on your boxes so you know which one belongs to which. If you pick mine up, this one says ZC. ZC. Don't ask. Now, we don't need this anymore, so we'll take it out of the way because I hate what happens when I bang my elbow off it. Oh, yeah. I really like the, these um, Vicmark chucks. I think they're the best chuck on the market. And I'm not getting any money from Victor Marchese for saying that. But anyway, there we go. So you take your, this is usually out of wet wood, by the way. So what I do then is, That's why they're backwards. <coughs> Everything's upside down. Yeah. Okay. Now, for taking out the insides um, and doing stuff like that, I like to grind. Now, uh, we can see it. A lot of turners use this kind of shape where they grind it way back at the sides and then round the nose. So it's very good for different applications. Mine is fairly square on the tip. It's not it's not very long, you know what I mean? Now given the shape of it, you can push it into the middle of a piece and then pull sideways like that. And I rough it out and I leave it that thickness for that size and the same here and um, you can uh, do that with both halves, put them aside to dry, 
in my case I put them in a kiln I'm not going to do any more with that because I don't want to invent the wheel again but that's what you do uh, you do that with both sides and then you number it now when you take it out of the kiln it's not going to be round anymore um, it's going to probably be a bit crooked so what you do you grab it in the jaws of your chuck you know what I just discovered I think I'm on the wrong set of the fast ones are on the left I think yep I think I might just position it slightly differently so that we don't have a nasty accident. We'll put that there. And then you threw up the, the uh, just threw up the um, tenons because they will have they will have moved slightly. And you see I caught it by the rim. It's the same principle as when I was showing you how to center the face plate on a bowl. You center it on the widest part of the piece, not the narrowest. So therefore, we just catch the piece, catch it by the, um, by the rim. That way you're getting the most out of your piece. So just dress it down a little bit. We do the same with the body. You know, I think this is one of those backwards ones. Now you see how far off center that is. By the way, I always touch that corner just in case it goes a long way into the jaws and you end up with it getting trapped in the corner here with a little bit of dirt or something which would throw it off. So just a little bit of roundness there. Now the next thing I do, um, I would dry that in the kiln. And when it comes out of the kiln, um, I would then take it to a sander sand it flat on both surfaces so that they go dead flat against each other and then I would get my piece of contrasting wood which in this case is purple heart and I would glue them together you don't have to be fussy about grain matching or anything like that you just get them glue them together with a tight bond put them in a clamp or between centers if you have a spare lathe and just let them set all right, and this is what you end up with. I feel a bit like Martha Stewart. Here's one I made earlier. So look at this was glued earlier. Everybody with me so far? Good. Now what I've got here is a nice piece of burl, which came from um, somewhere down in Tennessee. It was grown in a graveyard. So some good old boy's juice has gone into this one. So what you do is you catch it by, you see that, that's wobbling around, that doesn't matter. You catch it by the lid because the first thing you're going to do is turn the inside of the lid. So get a good grip. Now you see the lid is spinning through. Now what you can do is get 
the spindle gouge and cut into the um, cut into the contrasting piece of wood only about less than a quarter inch about a quarter way in other words don't be tempted to keep going what happens if you keep going no okay you see the way that's off center well you'll take too much off one side and you'll never get the grain matching all right so just cut until you're happy that uh, now this actually has a tiny bit of flat in it so I'm going to take a bit off this as well with me so far good now by the way do you notice this I put a um, I take some of the middle out of this that's a good idea because there's stress inside in them and they relieve the stress when you let them even when they're dead dry the drier they are sometimes the more the stress will relieve itself when you take out the middle so it's always a good idea to do that so now the next thing I do is I part off you remember that little hole I had inside well there it is again So now what I want to do next is see I'm going to leave a little bit of the contrasting wood attached to the lid and the reason is that this might be soft wood so by putting this hard bit on here you've got something hard and solid to grip down on the step and it's a good idea. Now I like making, you can make these square, you can make them any shape you want but I, and you can make them shallower as well but I happen to like this particular kind of proportion I just like it. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut off some of the, the waste on the outside By the way, you know how you fill holes in little bits of burr like this? Did you, any of you ever see, um, oh I don't have it here, you get copper powder, very very fine copper powder and uh, you buy it, I think you can get it in um, from arts and crafts suppliers and you pour it into the hole and then you pour in your watery CA, CA, CA glue and it sets it solid. In fact, If you want to pass that around, you'll see that there is some of that filling on this one. See here? Yeah, you get very, very fine copper powder. It, in fact, it can, you get different, you can get silver and gold and copper and all kinds of, of um, metals in that way. Okay. <laughs> You'll have to. <laughs> Let me see. Can we do it in some way that won't? Maybe around his legs. 
Yeah. Here we go. Thank you. Now, this is a very clean cut on the face there, you know, from using my groove parting tool. The reason you use a groove parting tool is that it won't uh, tear out the wood as much. But you still need to go back and take a shave off it with a gouge. Now that's a nicer finish, a nice, uh, a much, a much uh, cleaner finish. Now, one thing you can do at this stage is decide how thick a wall you want to have your lid. And use the grooved parting tool with the groove down, thank you. Anyway, that'll be fine. Now the next thing is to um, take some more of the rough stuff out of the inside. We'll go back to our old friend, the, uh, the spindle gouge. Now we use a spindle gouge to um, remove some of the waste. Um, make sure you leave enough for the body, the lid of the, the thickness of the lid. Now I, I need to go deeper. Now when I start off first, I might have the tool level, you know, for starting. But as I go over to the side, I turn it up on its side. Because if you leave it level and it gets to here, what's going to happen? Dig! So I'll get it over on the side. Now, when you've satisfied yourself that you've taken enough out of the inside, it's time to clean up the shape of the inside. Now, what I use, I use a full round scraper like this. Now, how many of you who are doing the course on Monday were given a list of tools? Who's? <laughs> Sean. No, Do you remember that list of tools I sent you to send to give to each student for Monday? Okay, everybody. It, it says a suggested list of tools. Now, one of the tools it says in there is to use a round scraper for the inside of places like this. Now. People are going to come to on Monday and they're going to have small scrapers, all right? Now that's okay, uh, but when you're doing a curve like this, the larger the scraper, the easier it is to get a decent curve. It's nearly impossible to get a good curve with a small scraper because as you come round, the small scraper will go in, out, in, out, in, out. You'll get little bits of waving. Whereas the big scraper, it doesn't do that. So that's why I suggest that. And even if the box was only a tiny bit bigger in diameter inside, I would still suggest you use that size of a scraper. Because the, the heavier the scraper 
and the, the more it fills out the curve that you're making the easier it is it's going to be far 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 easier okay you can sharpen I oh you sharpen it on I use white uh, stones at home okay. but I do sharpen it by hand I mean what I do instead of using a jig I use uh, use this guy now see that that is a terrible nuisance that's not what I'd call it if I was at home but anyway we have another word for it so what you do is you turn it down so that it's backwards see that now you've got a nice straight edge all right the other thing you can do is get a file and file that so that it's or, or do it on your um, belt sander sand that flat and sand that corner flat or even get a bit of sandpaper now why in the name of John Hancock would you do that well the reason is that when you move along this I bet you you'll feel it uh, skip you'll feel it get tripped have you felt that come on nod vigorously you all have right so the trick is and this is where um, your free hand grinding is really important this needs to be higher so when you get now you can of course do this takes a bit of while bit of time but you can do this then there's tape on it for some reason it gets in the way so oh is that what that is she was better looking than you okay right oh her you know everywhere I go people say um, oh yeah Ashley Harvard was here three weeks ago and you say to the guys what did she do we don't know we were too busy watching <laughs> what would you say oh my wife would always be sitting beside me <laughs> okay um, we're back to this nonsense with the can we have another one of these please oh wait now here's one Now the trick is to make sure that you don't now the other thing is watch that you don't put your knuckles there and I've done this so many times but you go gently all the way around in a smooth flowing motion like that Did that make sense? Yeah. Good. Now, the next thing about making a box with a lid is that um, if this is the inside of your lid, and it's coming down on a step like that, always undercut right here right inside the lid right there and the reason you do that is so that when you come down on this step it grips it positively but what people make the mistake of doing is doing this that's the outside they come down and they do this and then when the top of the step pushes against here and it's loose they don't know why do you follow me 
So always undercut so that the grip is very positive, right there at the corner, right there. That that is what grips the step. Now to get a nice curve you need a nice flowing action as well as a proper shape on the scraper you need a flowing action. Okay that's not too bad. Now if you want to find out whether uh, you've got an undercut get your very near calipers. Mm -hmm. It's probably an old joke. very near, open it out and you can tell if it's an undercut because the points which are inside a bit will be rubbing on wood and if they are then go back and undercut a bit more. Alternatively if you have a square edge like this and you just put it there like that and get it parallel with the with the ways yeah that's undercut yeah do you understand what I'm doing? You just need to be able to tell if it's undercut. Okie doke. Now I've got a slight dimple in the middle. Okay. Now, we're going to finish it. Now, I usually use Shallow Wax, uh, Triple E and Shallow Wax cream. I have the Triple E, but I don't have the Shallow Wax. So what I have instead is, um, I went and I robbed Sean uh, McMahon's finish. So it's a little bit different than what I usually use, but that's okay. Well, it, it, uh, just give me a second here now. He uses it as a pen finish, and I've, I've tried it out, and it works very well. So, what, um, what you've got here is Moylan's, Sean, what is that? Okay, and that's, One of them is sander sealer. Which one is this? That's sander sealer, isn't it? Oh, wait a minute. Where is the sanding sealer we brought in? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, forget everything I said for the last five minutes. This is sanding sealer. This is pen plus finish. Is that correct? All right. <laughs> Now, usually um, what you can do is you can sand down the inside of the piece a little. Okay, do we have a scissors in the house? Or a knife? Ah. Just cut that about there. And don't go too far away. No, I, I mean, stay close. <laughs> stay close. Now this is 100 grit um, Abronet. So we'll start with that. And this will take out any of the 
rough torn grain areas or most of them anyway okay so that's the hundred grit then we get the sanding sealer now when you're turning a pen you probably sand down to 400 grit before you do this but this is a di slightly different just use 100 grit and apply this sanding sealer you can apply a bit to that area there if you like Have you lots of this, Sean? You have lots of this? Good. <laughs> so we've done it with the 100 grit and we've put on a bit of... Uh... <laughs> Sorry about that, Chief. You're making me nervous. <laughs> now this is 180 grit so the sander sealer really helps cellulose particularly sander sealer really helps to fill the grain and makes it easier for the paper to cut There's two kinds, there's a shellac sander sealer as well, which is what I use with um, salad bowls and stuff like that. Now, feels pretty good. You can give it more sealer, give it more sandpaper, you can Keep at it until you're happy. It's easy to make me happy. So that's the 180 grit. This is tooth. <laughs> How an Irish woman knows there's too many beans in her stew. Too farty. Okay, that's too farty. This is 320. Oh yeah. I love it when a plan comes together. Now, with the Shallow X and Triple E, they reckon you should go down to about 600. But uh that's as far as I'm going. I'm going to put on some of this pen finish now and see how it looks. This is the first time I've ever done this. I ran out of um, shallow wax cream. So.
beautiful job but that's the inside of the lid done ah that's fairly nice now and we take the body Now, the first thing I suggest you do is uh, true up the face. Throw up the face of that. Take a bit more out of the inside. Now you can use the you can use the parting tool with the groove down. Yes, sir. On the top? Yeah, we were talking about, you know, when you've got a contrasting wood to make up for the width of the parting tool. Yeah. You probably misunderstood me. Um, it goes between like that. Yeah, your the thicker part stays, the part that's going to be the step stays with the body and the thinner piece that's just a ring stays with the lid. Okay. All right? Okay, now. I'm looking for me, here we are. Now, you take the, the calipers and uh, just measure the internal diameter of the inside of the lid and then widen it out so at the moment it says uh, 78 millimeters okay so we'll go a little bit extra we'll go out to about 79 millimeters And we'll mark a ring on this, starting out in the waist. Keep going in till both pointers are in the same groove. Now, the reason I do that, I'm not going to cut down to that and then put that on and it's going to fit. That's not the idea. The idea is to uh, give me an idea of how much to cut off here. In other words, it's a guide. Now I can also see from the width of that that I have plenty to take off. Hey, don't do that, stupid. There we go. And if you want to, you can Hold that there. Don't go down all the way, just take off some of it. Now, we're going to leave a certain amount of usually about the same width as what's on that one. So the thing is, don't go past the line that you drew. Uh, 
as a guideline. Don't go past that. And just to be sure, have a look. Now, do you remember I was talking earlier about what woods to use for this? And I mentioned uh, that you're better off using a very hard tropical hardwood. And uh, one of the reasons why is that the grain is going the wrong way. In other words, usually when you're turning a box, the grain is going this way. Well, in your little bit of contrasting wood, it's going the opposite way. And you can get away with that with something like Purple Heart. You'd also get away with that with something like Ebony. Um, people have used Walnut and other native woods and they'll get a perfect fit and then the next day the fit's gone because that wood moves more. So your tropical woods are much more stable and less likely to move. So um, the other thing that happens a lot is that um, boxes, um, you're better off if you can make your box fit too tight and give it an opportunity, it will shrink a little bit, so make it too tight and let it give it an opportunity to shrink. So I'm going to fit the lid Just excuse me a second, there's something really funny going on here. There's a bit of play. Okay. Now, I'm going to fit only a little bit. Another mistake people make, they go straight at it with, this, with the parting tool, and they cut all the way in, and they try to fit it in one go. That's a big mistake. Because what happens if you take the whole thing down too far? So what you do is you fit just a little bit on the outside. Just on the outside. And kind of, if you like, put a little uh, slope. Put a little slope in it. So if you take too much off. We're not there yet. We have to go past the line that I drew earlier. And this is definitely a, somewhere where I take my time. And I take light brushing strokes. And I don't care how bored you get watching me, I won't rush it. cuts a lot better when it's sharp, I can tell you that. Now, do you know what's a good idea? Before you fit this to the final fitting, uh, take out more of the inside if it needs it. Do you know why? Because it will relieve more stress. Um, so let's see now, we'll take a bit off the back as well. Okay. 
Well, what worries me is that when I fit the box perfectly, the wood will move and my fit will go. So what I'm going to do now is I just took a bit off here. I'm going to take more out of the inside. In fact, I probably finished the inside before I do the final fit here. Reason is that if you make a perfect fit here, then take out the inside. When you take out the inside, you relieve stress and the fit's gone. Does that make sense? Great. I'm just going to through that. And I'll take some more out of the inside with this. I use pulling strokes um, mainly. And then when I've taken away a lot of waste, I lift up the rest a little bit. Now, I've taken out most of the inside. I'll probably go back again with the scraper, but before I do anything more, I've taken away most of it, so therefore when I make my fit, it should hold. Now, remember that very tight fit I had earlier? You just want to keep it that way. light brushing strokes and round that corner ever so slightly It's just a little bit too loose. It's lady fit, not gent fit. Okay. Yeah. Now, we're going to shape the outside, but we go to a smaller gouge. Now, you could also bring up the tailstock, but uh, we might be okay.
it's important that you make sure whether it's a, a paper fit like this or whether it's a very tight fit make sure that your bevel is riding correctly and that it's pushing the lid on what you don't want to do is pulling it off Now I'll pull this back so that I get in closer. Make sure your bevel is riding like that. Take a few cuts in the waist area and take your time. Remember I'm depending on a piece of paper towel. Now I left a good bit of thickness in the in the lid there earlier on, um, so I can take a good bit more off off the height. Still a little bit left there. By the way, you notice the way I'm leaving a little bit. See the way I'm not cutting it all the way? You see the little nibble I'm leaving? Because if you go the whole way, you'll pull out the last little grain and you'll end up with a little white dot. Whereas if you do this, and then sand it off with a bit of rough paper, Much better, right? How okay. Many a do you to, have on your to be honest, I just make them different each time, and um, 
if it's a wood that's going to flex a lot I would leave it a bit thicker if it's a wood that's like burl you can get away with a very thin wall you know especially nice tight burl like this um, if you sell a box and it's got a half inch thick wall the person who buys it is not going to measure the wall and the other thing is that um, it's it's the concept as to how the piece looks you know you really don't have to um, risk losing a piece just to prove that you can cut as thin as somebody else Do you know it's 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 like enjoy it and make it and don't worry too much about the thickness it's, I'm a bit like thickness is the same way as I am about the other thing about angles <laughs> just don't put yourself under too much pressure now what I'm going to do next is finish the outside so far so you remember we started off with with 100 grit There's just one, I'm just going to check for um, any torn grain. One little detail that's important um, when you're making a box, whether it's um, whether it's one of these boxes or just a straight grain box, you see where the, the lid meets the body right there when that closes in you've got a joint always round the two corners slightly here so that if you round these two corners ever so slightly um, if the wood moves a little bit and you do that you'll never feel a sharp edge because it'll be rounded so I'm gonna sorry at the moment I'm not it will automatically line up when the finished when it's done um, so I'm just gonna touch the two corners And then we put on some of this uh, sanding sealer. Let me go for the 180.
240. Three twenty. And we get some of our pen finish. Pretty wood. Why? It's um, maple barrel, and it comes from Tennessee. Grew in a graveyard. Yeah. It's the best bloody wood I've ever. <laughs> Now, <laughs> this could be fun. Oh. Anyone got a skew chisel? You think I'm joking about the skew chisel, don't you? One second. I think skews should have been. No, you can keep that. Okay. Thank you. Now, what you do, it's the only use I have for a skew, by the way. Push it into the groove. Now, the only thing is, you have to go back and sand the corners. Yeah, you just sand the corners. Remember I said you needed to round them anyway.
Nope. Okay, this is an interesting problem. I did. Hmm? Yeah. <clears throat> that won't fit. I've got to get something. I'm proving my own point too much, that's the problem. That wasn't a crack. It's a what? I've never actually had this happen before. Where anything can happen. And the thing is, try and get it off without... Oh yeah. Right. Is that luck or skill now? Is that what? Is that luck or skill? I think it's bloody luck. Now the thing about skill and luck and all these things is that the more you practice, the, mo the luckier you get, yeah. Now, I'm kind of wondering what that noise is. Really? Okay, so I didn't do it. I don't care then. Yes, sir. Those of us that are paramatics, sometimes if you get the belt one notch over, oh, yeah. the side of it is actually catching the, uh, the big wheel. Yeah, it's not, I, it isn't actually that, so, okay. but I do take your point. Yeah. It happens with the one way as well. In fact, any of those groovy belts, it'll happen. Now, there's a little bit of torn grain inside here. Sorry about this, Sean. Did you say you had lots of it? Good. I was wondering why that knock was so familiar. I have the same one in my own lathe at home. And I have not been able to find why. Now, you see the way I bound it up a bit with the sealer? Oh, 
Okay. Exactly. A hardening agent. Well, stick your nose in both of them and you'll find out very quick because it the cellulose one is dead poison and the shellac one they are totally different um, products. The cellulose uh, now they both come f the shellac comes from a beetle and cellulose comes from timber. Out of cellulose? Now there's a surprise. I would just take any one of them. They're all as bad. Well, I tell you the truth, I think it's a brilliant sealer. I think it works great. It's just that right now I'm beginning to feel a little bit groggy. <laughs> I think you need to wear breathing protection when you're using it. In a demo situation, of course, that's not always possible. Oh yeah. I used to run a workshop in training psychiatric people for 11 and a half years and if that doesn't explain one or two things I don't know what does. But um, we used to make a range of bowls and we would turn the bowls um, out and then on the raw wood we had a, a cupboard with fans attached and all the bowls went in there and a guy went in there with a big can of of um, cellulose sealer and he just painted it straight on to the raw wood every bowl and then when you put them on the lathe now remember this was before the days of uh, disc sanders so you went then with your sandpaper and the sandpaper, it really helped. It binds the fibers so tight and it sands off so quickly. It's an amazing product. So I hasten to add, before we sent anyone in there, we put a very good um, mask on them. Now I didn't do much sanding on this area up to now and I'm just going to do a little bit with the finer grits 240 and 320 because I don't want it to go too loose it's already loose enough
And now for finish of the inside, I just use the uh, the pen finish again. Okay, rub on, rub off. Vax on, vax off. Perfect lady fit. Now, last step. Take the bottom off. Now the first thing you want to do is measure the internal depth. Oh boy, I've made a right mess there. But anyway. No, that's good. Oh no. See if it will work on the inside. Yep. Now, um, um, you can use paper towel, um, but I have something else which I seem to have mislaid. And it's a drawer liner. Drawer liner, this stuff, absolutely fabulous for this job. Now remember my small gouge. Now this is the bit where you want to be really careful. See how I did that? Hey. 
still got a little bit of the old swing. Mm. And again, I'm leaving the little bit in the middle. I think that base is a little bit too small. There was a f um, famous painter at home in Ireland. Daughter was setting up a studio and uh, the famous painter said to the daughter, when you set up your studio, he said, and you've got all your brushes and all your palettes and all your easels and your lighting and everything fixed up, he said, buy yourself a big wooden mallet. And she said, why in the name of everything would I need a wooden mallet? I'm a painter, not a carver. And he said, you know, when you paint a painting and you stand back and you look at it from a distance and you think, hmm, maybe just a little bit more blue right there. Take the mallet, hit yourself on the head. It's mallet time. So now, just get rid of that little nib in the middle. little bit of the sealer what's that oh no that's in the inside of a bowl yeah right <laughs> chicken <laughs> very very well self-preserved chicken It's a lot easier to get a good um, finish on the outside without getting any tears in your burl than it is on the inside.
there's no um, really strong yeah that's it <laughs> yeah not the best one I've ever made Well, if it comes from uh, rescuing yourself from disaster, yes, it was. I think the answer is that the best of us make mistakes. So, you want to take a 10 minute smoko, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom? What? That's what the Australians call it, a smoko. This song, as all of our all of our songs, has nothing in it whatever to do with squirrels. There.
and it's between the baby soothing power of a Duracell C cell and the tips on how to calm a baby from your mother-in-law that always seem to involve a fair amount of brandy. Go with C cell. That's not just some battery. That's a Duracell battery. That's a power you can trust.
Nebraska through my eyes, you would see all. Okay, so um, we're getting smaller in number, but that's okay. The day goes on. People have stuff to do. Now, um, what I'm going to do is just finish this bowl just to talk about finishing, and that's pretty much it. Um, just for fun, um, earlier on, Okay, I would have ferocious speculation as to why somebody would steal Vaseline. <laughs> okay, now what I use for finishing um, food bowls is plain old mineral oil which I am also too stupid to see right now here we are this time of day I always get a bit half stupid um, this is mineral oil lubricant laxative for the relief of occasional constipation right if you can use it for a baby when they have you know a blockage you can use it for food on your bowl okay just not the same stuff. <laughs> right. This is very safe. I've been using this for donkey's years. It's been tested and proved and couldn't have anything safer. And it, I, I make hundreds and hundreds of uh, salad bowls and fruit bowls every year. And I have a number of stores that buy them regularly. London, Dublin. I used to sell them to a guy up in Vermont who used to supply a couple of shops that he had in New York and Boston and places like that. But that went by the way because his son decided to be a woodturner. And that was that. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'll show you how I use the mineral oil. The reason, when we went to buy the mineral oil, I spotted this jar of petroleum jelly and it was only a dollar. So I said we'd bring it along just to tell you something. If you're going to make a bowl and use it for fruit or porridge or stew or whatever and 
you turn the ball and you sand it and you want a quick finish there's your man rub it in give it a spin that's it your bowl is ready for use for food again very safe right penetrates and is waterproof obviously and it is absolutely brilliant I knew a turner I worked for him for about six months and he supplied a very large um, chain of stores in Britain with a porridge bowl a particular porridge bowl and he made thousands of these porridge bowls and he applied this with a rag sitting down he didn't he did he they were turned on the lathe taken off um, sanded they were turned and sanded and taken off the lathe and left outside to dry in the sun and then somebody was put sitting at a table with a bunch of bowls and a rag and this stuff and he rubbed it on and that was it perfect finish for food all right look at you you have no control over how often people finish a bowl once it leaves your hands if you recommend that people occasionally oil it up that's as good as you're going to do you know what I mean so but the mineral oil finish is the one I prefer and uh, so generally speaking um, the finish I get at home is about the same as this might even be a little rougher because um, what I tend to do is to start my sanding uh, when I have uh, power I start sanding everything with 80 grit whether it needs it or not I don't use the 80 grit on the surface here 120 will do that I use it up in here now back home I have a uh, very very efficient um, dust extraction system my lathe is here the wall is here there's a great big hole in the wall and there's a fan and you turn it on whoosh, sucks it all out I mean that's it same thing we see our winter isn't like your winter It isn't quite as agricultural as I make it sound as I have a, a square box built around the hole in the wall and the fan is hidden in there and uh, I have a, a cover that I take off the box when I want to use it and the cover has four inches of insulation for the winter so anyway that's the uh, 80 grit and then we have 120 120 grit At home, um, you know the way I can't reach down to the very bottom here with this, it hits off the body. Well, you know your little Milwaukee uh, angle grinder thingy? Very good for getting in down there. Also for getting up under here. Very good. I have one of those beside the lathe the whole time. I use the 120 grit on the face here
Okay, so get out the dust. Now here's the mineral oil. So you just exactly. I put the mineral oil on what is essentially the bare wood. But I do I do the uh, sanding with the, just the two. No, sometimes I use uh, 180 grit uh, dry as well. Pardon? Well, by the time I'm finished, it'll be dry. You know, the friction and everything, it just have a, it's in the wood and it's, it feels dry. Yeah. Back home, I have a bowl of mineral oil and a rag that's about five years old. <laughs> it's completely charged up with the stuff. Now what I'm going to do, because I've got this upper area here, which I wasn't able to, uh, I didn't have my angle grinder, I'm going to start with 100 grit right up in here. Look at that. It's a great um, system because the oil helps to clog the, helps to lubricate the action of the paper. So you cut down on the amount of dust that you take into your system. Of course, if you're doing this at home, like I wear a mask all the time. So I use the 100 grit and anywhere that I wasn't able to reach with the disc. So that's down here as well. Down here near the back. Where it clogs the paper. Now with this um, Abronet stuff, you can declog the paper very easily, which you can't do with regular paper. Now, having used 100 grit up in here, I'll put another little bit of oil on. And then we go to 180 grit. I usually dip it in the oil as well. I usually use wet and dry. I use the red, uh, the garnet colored wet and dry. That's the one I use. It's SIA paper. Um, it is available in this country, but it's not very often you see it. It's used mostly in the motor trade for bodywork. It is one of the best sandpapers you can get. And the discs I use are the same. They're the same SIA discs. Best ever. There's no disc to match them for lasting. And the cloth backed ones, they take a lot of hardship. The only problem is you have to buy like a hundred discs in a packet to get a to get them from the company. They don't like dealing with small amounts. That's the 180. Two forty. And finally, 
Okay, that's the finished bowl. Now, that's ready for food finish. Um, the only problem is if you put it in a store window and the sun gets at it, it'll dry out. So I use um, shellac-based sander sealer on all my bowls. And they're all on the face plate from start to finish. So they're still on the face plate, just like here. And I paint a coat on with a brush of shellac sander sealer, leave them overnight, pop them back on the lathe in the morning, and sand them off again with 400 um, wet and dry dipped in oil. Just a little rub of 400, and that flattens off any raised grain. But there's enough of the sealer left in the grain so that you're left with that nice texture for a long time. So it could be in a store window or in a friend's house if you give them a gift or whatever and it'll stay looking good for a much longer time and um, shellac is food safe so they say now we don't have shellac today so Now, I think I need to get uh, my hands on a... Just give me one second now. Talk among yourselves. Be thinking of hard questions to ask me when I come back. What? <laughs> hey, Bill. Yeah, sir. Look. Hey, the smokes. Oh, no, it's gone. Sorry about that, man. Where did we get it? Harbor Freight? No. I need to take out the screws, yeah.
there we go, um, which was fought in 1690 in which the Protestant King William won and which the Northern Unionists were celebrating ever since. And during the peace talks um, in 2007, where the peace process was finally brought to a conclusion, um, things were not going great. And uh, the leader of the Ulster Unionists, a man called Ian Paisley, was, was just kind of ready to go home and give up. And our Prime Minister had commissioned me to make a bowl, a vessel, out of this walnut tree. And so he had it with him every time he met Paisley for a long time, for about a year during the peace negotiations. He had this bowl and he never gave it to him. He kept it back, kept it back, kept it back. And then bang, right at the right moment at the peace talks, um, he walked up to Ian Paisley and he gave him the gift. And he said, I believe it's your wedding anniversary. He said, here's a present. It's made from walnut from the very site of the Battle of the Boyne and I'd like you to have it and the guy just about melted because up to that point he had never even shook our Prime Minister's hand but this time he put out his hand he shook his hand and he said thank you he said I believe we can do business today and that those pens are made from the same tree from the same branch it was a huge 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 tree it was seven feet diameter um, they reckon it was about 40 years old when the battle was fought, so it would be a 350-year-old tree. Uh, it was, as I say, seven feet, and when I was cutting the branch off, it was still live because it fell over, but there was about two or three of the roots still attached to the ground, so there was greenery coming out of it in places, you know. But anyway, if anyone wants one of the pens, they're 30 bucks, if anyone, and there's a little card with them uh, which I hope I have with me, which um, it's a little card that uh, says, what's the word, authenticates them as coming from the peace tree. So there you are. I do sell stuff, so, for the right price. Now, now normally at home, when I'm reverse chucking, I have a um, vacuum system sucking air through the thing here but um, if I don't have a vacuum system as in demonstration situations what I do is hmm? just put them between centers I just bring up the the point and hold it very lightly against it. I go on, Liam. You couldn't have got it right first time. Not possible. See, I wouldn't be happy unless I had to give myself a bit of hardship. That's got to be the Irish DNA, right? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Woo! Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will. I know there's other bits to it, but the main part is if something can go wrong, it will. I know what O'Neill's law is. That's the one. Murphy? Oh, yeah.
Now what I would do at home is I would have a little bowl of dust that I cannot go any deeper. So what I have at home is uh, when I'm sanding with the disc sanding, I'd be doing a lot of them. I'd be doing maybe 50 or 60 bowls at a time. So the dust would collect on the ways and I'd just get a bowl and just tip it into it. And I'd have a bowl of this really, really fine dust. And then um, take off the bowl and uh, pour in some of the dust and uh, put thin CA in besi beside it, fill it all up, leave it to dry, and then put it back and finish it. So that's what I do. And I have this lovely pattern of little dots all around the bottom. And people say, how did you manage to get all the knots in such a nice, neat pattern? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do that today. I think we'll, leave, we'll just leave it at that. Okay, so we'll have a question time if anyone has any any questions. How about discussing the virtues of negative rate scrapers? It seems to me that a regular scraper held at the proper angle becomes a negative rate scraper. Good man yourself. I was just going to say the same thing. I think it's a gimmick. Do you all know what a negative rake scraper is? What? Oh yeah, that's a good one. I tried them for a while. I, you just put a, an angle on the front here so that when you hold the scraper like that, there's automatically a downward angle. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why they can't tell people to just do that. I'm sorry, but it's one of my pet get-me-going rants. <laughs> so whoever said that over there, they're smarter than a lot of people. Actually, you know what? You just wised up to what these guys are doing, trying to make money off you. Well, I try to make money off you too, but at least I do it with a straight face. Any other? Steel. What? what about steel? Yeah. Um, they say that most um, high-speed steel tools are made from almost the same stock. So that if you buy a Henry Taylor or you buy a Sorby or you buy a Crown, um, they're supposed to be all made out of the same steel from the same factory. They're just different companies milling them out. Interestingly enough, um, when I'm buying one, I'm more concerned with the shape of the groove um, because I'm making the Irish grind. And the Irish grind uh, requires a little bit of thought. Um, let's get a, one of these guys. There's two basic kinds of flute. There's the that shape. And there's this shape. See the difference? That makes the best Irish grind. And the best shape that I've seen is the one with the black handle, the Pro, pro Am, Pro Light, Pro. Pro what? Pro Yeah. It's got a black handle. And of all the tools I've ever seen to make an Irish grind, that is the one that does the sweetest job. And the tool steel is good too. Um, are they especially made for somebody like Brad Packard or somebody? No? He sells them anyway. Yes, sir. Um, I have never claimed the title. Yeah. I don't claim it. I let him tell people that I am. 
No, I did it. Yeah, no, I did it, I did it. I'm sorry, guilty. <laughs> but, um... Why in the world would you do that? Do what? <laughs> Develop the Irish side. Well, if you, if you look at it, um, the different things that it does, it does so many uh, things that a normal grain can't do. Um... Your long sides will cut a much bigger cut. I mean, have you watched Len Lucas turn with the Irish grain? But his his is ground twice as far back. Um, What's the secret to the Irish grind? What what characterizes the Irish grind? Um, the, the, um, have you got a a close up camera? <coughs> now, take, oh, there we go. Right, there's even a black area there. Okay, this one, the one I'm moving at the moment, is a normal grind, traditional grind. The other one is the Irish grind. Do you see the length of the, the side wings? Swept back. Well, Initially, that's all it was. It was sweeping back the sides as a means of taking a much bigger cut. That was, that was the first thing. Um, then, um, as I said earlier, I watched people like Ellsworth use it in ways that I would have never thought of using it. Um, and I began to see other possibilities. So that, you, you remember this morning I did those shear cuts with it? Well, you can't do that with a normal gouge. You simply can't. But you can do it with this. You can do those shear cuts. You can do those shear scrape cuts. Um, all of those things. I should make a video, but I'm too darn lazy. So how does David Ellsworth's grind differ from yours, or is it one the same? There's very little difference. Okay. Very, very little. Um, I would say there might be a little bit farther back. But he does a lot of, if you ever see him when he has a log and he gets it and he starts doing this and he has these big shavings flying, you know. Um, that's kind of what he uses it for. Um, and then the fine cuts as well, you know. Um, I got the idea of using those fine cuts from watching Del Stubbs do it with a totally different gouge. Um, he was doing it with um, this little guy, the swept back shallow gouge, and he was the wood coming straight down on the on the side sweeps like that. So I thought, well, you can do it with this same thing. So gradually, from watching other people use my tool, I got ideas. Oh, and then maybe we could do this, you know, and that's how it works. No man is an island, and nobody can claim to have, you know. I remember one of the apprentices where I worked back in 1968, six, but between 68 and 72, and it was one of the apprentices who used to do this. He used to grind the tool back like that, and the guy that was training him used to uh, take him to task for it, tell him that that was wrong, you should go back to this. Now, it was years later that I sort of remembered it and started experimenting with it, you know. And by 1970, no, 1985, when Ellsworth came over, at that stage I was using it in my production work all the time. And that's it. What do you think the next big wave is going to be in terms of wood turning? What do you think? What, what's going to be your next? That's a very interesting question. And I'd say the person that knows that is going to be the next David Ellsworth. And I don't mean that in a cheeky way. I mean it just is the case that if you could foresee what the next big wave was and get on the crest of it, I don't know. I thought that when I started doing outside pieces, the big sculptural work, um, that that would take off. And for some reason, it hasn't. Not many other people can do that. They can. They sure can. It's 
I built a blooming lathe up in Iowa and made the piece in five weeks. And one week in the middle, I was down here with you guys the last time while the concrete was setting above in Iowa. So it, anyone could do it. I really don't understand why more people aren't doing it. Well, now, you saw me this morning. Did it look that bad? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but as well as oh, you can turn it off. Thanks. The brightness of my presence is enough. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. ah, that's better. Um, I remember the first time I showed that kind of work in this country um, was, I'm trying to remember, was it 2002? There was a big to-do up in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a collection, the Jane and Ar Arthur and Jane Mason Part of their collection was given to the Mint Museum in Charlotte, and there was two of my works in their collection that went to the museum. And as a consequence, I was invited over to a special conference. So they didn't just present the collection to the museum. They had an, um, a seminar, and they had some demonstrations, but not that many. It was mainly slideshows and talks and that kind of stuff but they had an exhibition and everyone was asked to bring some pieces of their work. And I decided that that was the time I had been showing this outdoor work for three or four years in Ireland and selling it. And at this stage, I thought it was time to bring it across to this country and stick it up for people to see. And I had an enormous 33-inch uh, diameter burl oak natural, uh, natural edge with holes in it, burl vessel. Um, sitting up on it. The, pl the stand was made of four railway ties ca catty corner to each other, you know. And I put it in the exhibition and um, funnily enough, collectors who were there um, looked at it and then said, have you any more? So I pulled out a folder of pictures and showed it to them and they went for a completely different one, a very plain shape but a beautiful shape. And uh, so it, it was, they bought one. So that was it. The trip was paid for. But I'll never forget this. The negative comments that people made about the piece, not the, not the shape of the piece, just the idea of the chainsaw. Top wood turners and top collectors sort of poo-pooed it. I don't know. It was weird. Without knowing the facts, they just sort of took against it. Oh, they were the ones who were in art school. I was in the school of hard knocks. Yeah. <coughs> Usually, the artists are always looking around for uh, the, the latest. Uh, who's, who's the guy that throws paint on four by eight foot sheets of plywood and cuts them up? <laughs> well, I I don't know I I I I I'm, I'll never criticize another artist. Um, it's amazing. Um, I had reason to say that about somebody recently. I don't know how many of you ever heard of Liam Flynn. How many of you ever heard of Liam Flynn? Well, his work is in all the top collections in this country and and worldwide, and uh, uh, he passed away four weeks ago at forty eight. He was found dead in the morning. But his work is incredibly simple, beautiful work. I Just Google him when you go home. Liam Flynn. Yes, sir. And the, the reason I'm saying that is that I had to write an obituary 
And what I said about him was I had known him since we started the Irish Woodturners Guild in 1983. And I had never once heard that man criticise another turner. And I can't say that about myself, you know. But uh, it was just uh, something about the guy. Never once mentioned another turner in any negative way whatsoever. And I thought that was a great legacy. So when it comes to Jackson Pollock or anybody else, I just, I don't know, I don't feel right about criticising him. I, it wouldn't be my cup of tea. <laughs> I don't see it. Picasso I can see. You know, um, somebody like that. Um, Monet or Manet or um, um, I, I used to love um, the guy who did uh, Rodin. I love Rodin's work. Um, and uh, I started off as a plain jobbing woodturner with no education and then gradually um, became a figurative sculpt sculptor. And I had to learn to appreciate figure and how you do it and drawing and everything else. So I suddenly realized that those guys knew a lot more than I gave them credit for, <laughs> you know. Yes, sir. Kind of a partial answer to the question was here. Yeah. Um, I was in the Wood Turners Club in Tulsa <coughs> for yep. many years. And okay. I got to know many Bob Hawks. Right. You may know Bob. I've heard of him. What? I've heard of him. Yeah. Um, he came into wood turning from the Pollock Group. Okay. Okay. And uh, graphic design. And um, uh, Bob decided after several years of wood turning, he would do an odyssey or he would do a trip and he went to Europe. And he went to Ireland and then England and France and I think he met with Esther Young. Sure, yeah. Hmm. Of the Irish, who you know, if you visited them, they would say, "Oh yeah, let me sh let me show you my shop, and here's how I bring the spinach or whatever it is there. They're open and willing to share." Sure. And the Brits, the Brits were too. Yeah, they are actually. They're not very. Not very there isn't too many things you can say about them that's. Very, very, <laughs> very positive and very open. No, I have to tell you. And, and then yeah. Oh, yeah. Which was very secretive. And if you're a master wood turner, you guard your secrets. You hoard yeah. your knowledge and you pass that on only to those um, selected apprentices who study under you for years. And so what he experienced was that, for instance, in Germany, the wood turning he, he experienced there was quite primitive. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and he came home really appreciating clubs yeah, like yeah. this where we share and share and share and treat one another mm -hmm. because we energize each other. That's right, yeah. So I'm saying, I don't know what the next wave will be, but I'm betting it will come from an English-speaking culture. Mm -hmm. That's right. The new ways will not come from within. Yeah. Um, funny thing about 
airbrushing and other things that I would I would say that the tools and tool use um, probably initially at least started in our neck of the woods like the developments of high-speed steel gouge work you know the the tools to make stuff that all began over there now now you have people over here who are quite creative and I like the Stuart system is one of my favorites but um, um, I would say that when it comes to concept the US is miles ahead of Europe I would say the Australians now have caught up very quickly with the US they're good at concept but the US um, when you think about it I started off as a jobbing wood turner making salad bowls and platters and plates and all this the first time that my eyes were out on sticks was when I saw the work of David Ellsworth and uh, Moltrop and Dale Nish and um, Hogbin Canadian guy you know those guys were just so far ahead of the pack when it came to concepts Bob Stocksdale. Bob Stocksdale was way ahead of his time. You see, there was a guy in the, the development of, of modern wood turning started with a guy called James Prestini, who started to make little small bowls, wide open shape, flared shape, and they were not made for use, they were made for beauty. They were just pure shape, but they were small little pieces. He was a professor in, in a university, I think he was in Berkeley. Um, and what Stocksdale did, he, Stocksdale was a friend of his, what Stocksdale did was he took it further and made the same kind of shapes, but he used coloured wood. He started to use macadamia wood and uh, pistachio wood and um, macassar ebony and all of those. And suddenly wooden bowls became objects of absolute amazing beauty. And at the same time, Ellsworth started to make hollow vessels. And Ellsworth's idea for making hollow vessels, he will tell you, came from pottery. You know the, the closed-in vessels with a small hole at the top? That's been done in pottery. So that's where he... And I have to tell you, when I started seeing his work, I was just out on sticks. I couldn't believe it. The first seminar I went to in 1980, my wife and I, there was two Irish people there, and... Uh, and uh, it was held in Britain, and they had um, Ellsworth there, Ray Key, Richard Raffin. Um, but there was a guy, th uh, a guy there called Jerry Glazer, the tool guy, and he showed um, he showed a, a slideshow. And in the slideshow, he introduced us all to the work of Moltrop and Osalnik, and you know all those guys who were so inventive. You know, and that's what I remember. I was punch drunk going home. And I remember my wife and I stopped in a hotel in Wales on the Sunday night. Um, we were catching the ferry home to Ireland the next day. And I remember in the middle of the night dreaming about shapes and seeing all these weird concepts in wood. And um, when I went home, I just had to start doing the same thing. And then I started to make pieces out of burl and spalted wood and imitating, trying not to make the same shapes, but imitating the ideas, Ellsworth and Stocksdale. And I went to a local art gallery, which was a really conservative art gallery in Limerick, and showed him the work. And the guy was like, wow, yes, I'd like to sell those, you know. And it turned out that he had done a bit of turning as a hobby, but he had only ever made like me candle holders and egg cups and you know but he took the stuff and he began to sell it and I began to get prices like I get a week's wages for one piece I was like what <laughs> so it it's it's amazing we were people like me were blessed we were totally blessed because we were in at the beginning and part of the whole thing from the start that's a that that's that's a, a special privilege but I would say that the concepts, um, I would say 
Pristini, Stocksdale, Ellsworth, Osalnik, Moltrop, Nish. Those are the guys. Yeah. I don't know who influenced Moltrop. I know that he started in the 50s making those big vessels. He was an architect. He was an architect and he started making these big pieces. He made his own lathe out of, um, it was a big, essentially it was a plywood box with a bearing on top. And he developed his own tools. And to be honest, it's hard to know with people like him where he got his ideas, but um, I would say he just got the idea of turning big pieces from somewhere. And the only, like, I would have to say this, and it's not meant to be a criticism of Moltrop, I don't think he was the best designer in the world. I think his shapes were, were because they were colorful and big, they appealed to architects. Um, but I would have thought that some of the, some of the aspects or some of the elements of his designs could have been better. And I don't mean to, you know, it's just a, I think that uh, Philip, his son, does a far better shape. For instance, Ed's shapes were all almost like a circle, right? Whereas Philip's are parabolic and they're much nicer. Yeah, Philip's son, Matthew, he's turning now as well. Now, I have no experience of his work. Yes, sir. Mm. With a wall that thick, and then you start wood carving on it, mm. you're you're in for act really a few months. Oh yeah. Of work. Yeah. It's not, it's several weeks at the very shortest in, mm. in months, and most of us most of us just don't have the stamina to. to yeah, are the way of. Hmm. I don't think very many of us can. Yeah. No, I think you're right there. I think um, um, I, I, the reason why I didn't mention him in my list is that I didn't start carving back then. And if I had, I probably would have thought he was the one, you know. Um, I mean, there was others. There was Merrill Salen, one of the first big lady turners. I don't mean big lady. I mean <laughs> popular. Yeah. Um Lady Turners from California was experimenting with color and texture on types of wood like redwood, which is hard to work with. I have one of her platters, which was made in redwood, and it's textured and colored, and it's back, it must be 30 years old. You know, like, there's people like that that we don't always think of. Del Stubbs was amazing for his thin work, very thin walled work. I mean, we had him in in our house, and I've seen him work. He was in my shop lots of times. Um, I'm trying to think of others. Well, there's another one that you never hardly ever hear mentioned now, and that's he passed away last year. That's Giles Gilson, who used to do a lot with. Um, uh, he used he, he used to restore cars, and uh, so he knew how to use airbrushes. And he used to use automotive paints and stuff like that. So he used to make the most amazing pieces. We're, we're talking back in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, pieces that... Just Google them sometime. Giles Gilson. You know, there was a bunch of them. And for some reason, it just exploded onto the scene. I mean, us Europeans, Mac Raffin, Key, myself, Mick O'Donnell... We all started out as as uh, bowl makers. We all started out earning a living as production turners. Ray Key was a pattern maker in a car factory and started turning. And his shapes are very mechanical. For that reason, Raffin started out, uh, he was selling wine and he started wood turning as a way. He, he, there was a local wood turner 
called Dougie something or another and he started to work with him and decided this was a good way to make a living so he started making and to this day he still does scoops and egg cups and little games and great bowls and you know but production we're all production Glenn Lucas is a production turner I'm a production turner Yeah. And it's kind of like, I appreciate the form and function. Yeah. The beauty in that. The surface decoration, yeah, it's kind of nice, but sometimes it seems to be kind of, kind of going overboard. And it's also almost like there's two two divisions. There's almost a division in wood turning. When we were doing the Irish stone wall, for instance, there was uh, 20 turners from around the world. And you could tell the production turners from the arty turners. You know, the production turners were the guys who did all the hard work. The arty turners sat there looking cute and doing little things, you know. Fractal burnings, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. That's why I said the first thing I do in my demo is a regular bowl. Because I always say, if you can do a regular bowl, you can do anything. You practice on that. You know. Well, you kind of got... That's good, you know. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's wonderful to have, be, have the opportunity to be able to talk to someone who knows that history and who was a part of that history. And that's, you know, a treat for us. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I know Liam's got family to see and everything else, but uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to you know, make for us today and to share your knowledge and experience with us. No problem. Certainly look forward to the, uh, the hands-on class on Monday. And yeah. Really, if you could give us just a quick run through on your itinerary, you're going to, are you going to be back here for the... Uh, no, I'm not here for the symposium. Um, no, I'm um, doing a teaching next week in um, North Carolina in Asheville. I'll be staying with Greg Shramick and uh, doing a couple of days there. Then I'm going to a club in northern Alabama. Tommy Hartline is the name of the guy there. And uh, then I'm going home. Um, I'm only doing three stops this trip. Now, next, this time next year, I'm doing a, a trip through Ohio. I'm doing nearly all the clubs. I'm doing Akron, Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland, the whole nine yards, the whole circuit. And then I'm coming here. And my son is graduating on the 13th of May next year as an MBA. So um, for that reason, I want to be here that weekend. So if you guys want to do a couple of days hands-on, we can do the... That bowl that I just did a while ago there with the undercut rim and whatever else you want to do. No, I'm not going to do a hands-on. And Actually, we were setting that up down in Aramont. Now, this is the funniest story. There, Greg Shramick, you know, the president of the AW, and myself were setting up a class in Aramont and we were going to get people to sign up and bring their own E220 chainsaw and we'd do it and all the rest. And I was up in Virginia um, doing a class, a hands-on class, and there was a guy in the class who broke my heart. You know, I was trying to teach him, and it hardly ever happens, but there are some people, and they should never go near a tool. And this guy just couldn't do anything. Now, I, I, I'm never going to mention his name, so it doesn't matter, but I'll tell you, he frightened me. He was so bad. And he was the first to sign up for the chainsaw class. And I said, no, I will not put myself through that, because that guy would damage himself. And I thought, you know, I've said, all right, it's, it's, it's safe if you just obey a few simple rules, but I would not like to do it with people doing a class. I think it would be something that if something happened to somebody, I'd never forgive myself. 
It's all right to do it here and let you go home and experiment or whatever. It's on your own head. But if it was in a class and I was in charge of that class, I wouldn't feel comfortable. So, no, I won't do a chainsaw class. I'll, I'll demonstrate it by all means, even as part of a class, because it only takes an hour to demonstrate. You know, I'll answer any questions. I'll even send you the plans for a concrete lay as I have them on <laughs> file. I don't care. It's not a big secret, but uh, sorry. No, that's great. So you plan to be back here in a year? In a year, I will be back. And, then, and if you want to do a hands-on class, um, by all means, I, I'm here anyway. So. We appreciate the offer. And yeah. Uh, we'll, that's, we'll give plenty of lead time to be able to. You know, Think about it. You're welcome. You're welcome. And um, thanks, uh, by the way, for being a nice group of guys and gals to teach, you know, to talk to and just do your stuff. And I just share what I know and uh, people listen and it works good. So there we go. We really enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks.